Well, we've been talking uh, all the week about, no, we haven't. <laughs> yes, we have. Two of us have been talking all the week. But we've been talking for the last few Sundays about understanding our position in Christ and in uh, praying from that position. And uh, I think part of the reason that, that it just, we talk about these things all the time and it seemed like the whole church has been talking about it and I, and I believe that we have. Um, it's so much in my spirit what Tim said last Sunday about the fact that there's coming a time quicker than most of us probably think that church is going to be going on 24-7. That, that ministry teams will need to be available 24-7. But the fact of the matter is, just because there's not an organized meeting happening 24-7 right now, we are having church 24-7. Because any time that two of us come together in the Lord, church is taking place. Because where's the church? Here, here. So think about that the next time you're in a restaurant or on the street or at work because church is happening and there are people out there who are looking for some light and we have to know who we are in Christ in order to have that light shine the way God intended it to do. God's grace is amazing and wonderful and beautiful. But if you don't know the many aspects of, of what he's provided in that, you can't take advantage of those. It's like having a bank account set up in your name when you were a child and never drawing from it because you didn't know it was there. Well, we're going to find out what's there and walk in it, right? Praise you, Jesus. So we've already looked at uh, Philippians chapter 2 that basically told us that we are to have the same mind that Jesus Christ had when he basically abased himself and made a servant of himself in order to come to this earth and give us a plan of salvation to begin with. And because of, of his willingness to do that, that God highly exalted him. Well, when we take on that same mind and begin to humble ourselves to what God says that we are, then God also exalts us. Not that, that we deserve to be exalted, not by any means whatsoever, but when we begin to act like Him, that naturally raises us up to a position where people can see Him in us. And in looking at that, we looked at uh, the book of Ephesians uh, and saw somewhat of what that place is when we are seated with him in that heavenly realm and what kind of authority that that gives us uh, over the powers of darkness, over situations in our lives. And we looked in Hebrews 12 and saw more of that position of authority and that place from which we pray where that not only do we have the ability to talk to the demonic forces and tell them that they've got to get out, we have the ability and the authority to talk to the angelic forces yes. and, and to send them forth to do things on behalf of the kingdom of God. And so in all of that, we want to look today and see that, you know, in all of this, the reason God did this is because He's on our side. He Amen. wants us to win. He wants us to be victorious. And we're going to look first at uh, Hebrews chapter 4. And we'll start in verse 14. Inasmuch then as we have a great high priest who has already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession of faith in Him. 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weakness and infirmities and our liabilities to the assaults of temptation. But we have one who has been tempted in every respect as we are, yet without sinning. I think it's very notable that, that the writer of Hebrews, most people think it's Paul, I'm not going to say. God is the ultimate author. And he felt it very important to, to note that Jesus understood our weaknesses and our infirmities. We know all too well that we're incapable of a whole lot of things. You know, I say all the time, I don't know much, but I know enough to know that I need to go to the one who knows. <laughs> and it, it reminds me of, of um, what we spoke about a little bit, I think, last week or the week before from Romans 8, where the Holy Spirit also knows our infirmities and our inability. We don't even know how to pray like we ought, but the Holy Spirit is there. So you've got Jesus who understands that you're incapable on your own. You've got the Holy Spirit who understands that you're incapable on your own. But both of them are there to help you and to stand before the Father on your behalf to make sure that whatever it is gets right. Um, we've been listening uh, off and on to a minister whose name is Paul Brady from Ireland. And uh, he's just a, a dynamic man of God. And, and he talks about the revival that happened in Ireland that basically started him into his ministry. And the very beginning of it, from everything that they can tell, were these five little Irish teenagers that got together every night and prayed for the fire of God to fall in Ireland. Now they were going to a, uh, a church <laughs> that, you know, that, that teaches about believing God for things and, and, and how you stand on these things. And some of the older people in the church came to them and said, you know, I understand what you're doing, I understand your fervor, but you're not praying correctly. These are some things you need to do. -da -da -da. <laughs> I love what the little guy that was the leader of it said. He said, God knows what we mean. <laughs> and I think of that all the time because I, things will come up in my spirit to pray about. And, and I'll be praying along, and then a scripture will come up on the inside of me, and I realize that what I just prayed, according to that scripture, isn't necessarily accurate. However, the Holy Spirit brought the scripture to me because He already knew what I meant. And even if we mess up, because we're going to, because we're human, because we falter, the Holy Spirit's right there taking it to the Father the way we meant it to be. Jesus is right there standing before the Father saying, my blood was shed for this one. So I'm standing for their prayers to come to pass. So, with all of that, in verse 16, let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in good time for every need. Appropriate help and well-timed help coming just when we need it. John uh, 15, 7 says, If you live in me, abide vitally united to me, and my words remain in you, and continue to live in your heart. Ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. That sounds pretty much like come boldly. Don't be afraid to come and ask. John 16, 24 says, Up to this time you have not asked a single thing in my name, as presenting all that I am. But now ask, and keep on asking, and you will receive, so that your joy may be full and complete. 
God desires to give us the things that we're praying about. God has a perfect plan in place. Yes? It says asking. Tell me a little bit more about that. Is that asking and praying or asking and talking to other people? Well, I believe that in this he's, he's talking specifically about asking the Father, which would be a form of prayer. So you go to the Father in the name of Jesus and you ask for the things that you need to be accomplished in your life. Does that... Okay. <laughs> you still look like a big question mark. So I was like, oh no. <laughs> and so today we're going to look at um, a couple of instances of people in the Word who prayed and... Uh, what was the result of that? Um, the first is in Acts chapter 4. I apparently made a huge typo when I was typing this out because <laughs> there's like a four and then a whole bunch of numbers. And I <laughs> Maybe the cat walked by. I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> she thinks the keyboard is her place to sit when I'm trying to work on the computer. Now, I'll give you um, a little bit of, of background of this. This is just, just after the, the uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the, in the book of Acts. And uh, people have been being added to the church. And uh, Peter and John were put into prison for what they were speaking. They get out of prison and the... The leaders of the day tell them to stop speaking in the name of Jesus. And so they begin to pray. And they, we're going to pick up in verse 29. They, they start the prayer prior to that. And they go to God and they say, Now, God, you're the creator of heaven and earth. You've done all of this. You've done all of this. You're, you're wonderful, God. So they start with praising and worshiping God, which is good. But for time's sake, we're just going to read the last part where they actually made a demand on God. And now, Lord, observe their threats and grant to your bondservants full freedom to declare your message fearlessly while you stretch out your hand to cure and to perform signs and wonders through the authority and by the power of your holy child and servant, Jesus. So they're sitting here and they see that the, the leadership of their day, both religious and secular, does not want them proclaiming the name of Jesus because it's threatening. And they've already seen what God can do. They've walked with him for, for all of the years of his ministry and they've seen what he's done up to through the day of Pentecost and they've seen everything that's happened and they've been told, stop this. But by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, they said, Lord, you give us full freedom to declare your message fearlessly. Well, we know that they did this, that they went on, and you can read the whole rest of the book of Acts and see what kinds of wonderful things have happened. We're here today because of a simple prayer like this. Amen. Now, when you look in verse 31, I didn't write this in there, but when you look in that, it tells you that after they prayed, the very place where they were was shaken. So powerful prayers that are Holy Spirit led can change our circumstances even in a physical manifestation. Right. Now we're going to look at Acts chapter 10 and we're going to look at somebody who's a lot like us, or a lot like me. I really identify with this person because he was not a Jew. According to the teaching of the day, he could not be, he, he could not be a part of this great move of God that was happening. He was an outcast. And I understand that. <laughs> Acts chapter 10, verse 1. Now living at Caesarea, there was a man whose name was Cornelius, a centurion 
of what was known as the Italian Regiment, a devout man who venerated God and treated him with reverential obedience, as did all of his household. And he gave much alms to the poor and prayed continually to God. Now, wait a minute. I, I, he's, he's not a Jew. From any teaching that he may have heard, he can't be a part of this new move, uh, this messianic move that believes in Jesus. What's he doing? He's praying anyway. I believe with everything that's in me that he knew that God was going to honor words that had been spoken that said that God had come for all of humanity. So what happens when he prays? About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God entering and saying unto him, Cornelius, and he, gazing intently at him, became frightened and said, What is it, Lord? And the angel said to him, listen to this, the angel said to him, Your prayers and your generous gifts to the poor have come up as a sacrifice before God and have been remembered yeah. by him. That reminds me of Daniel, and he sat and prayed. He saw in the Word, Daniel saw that the time of the captivity of Israel was supposed to be over. It had been 70 years. Was it over? No. But he went to the Word and he prayed, and 21 days later, he gets an answer from an angel, but the angel says, from the very first day, your prayers were heard. So from the very first day that Cornelius began to pray, his prayers were heard. And God moved. Now, we have people of all different ages in here. Some of us have been praying for our community for 20 or 30 years. Those prayers have been heard. Some of us have been praying for situations in our lives for a very long time. Those prayers have been heard. And God is going to do what His Word says regarding those prayers. So if you're believing God for healing, don't stop because you don't feel good. <laughs> because God's promised healing. Now, to go back to what I said earlier about, about understanding where grace is in all of that, when I first started believing God for my own personal healing, I had to start that because I got sick. <laughs> so at the beginning of it, the healing did not sit. The healing had already been purchased. It had already been taken care of. But I wasn't taking advantage of it because even though I had kind of a head knowledge of what it was, I didn't have that word in me so deep that that was all that could come out. And I, I thank God for, for faith friends who stood with me and, you know, for Warren Fitch standing outside the bathroom door yelling at me, you are healed. <laughs> but I'm in the bathroom going, if you knew what was happening right now, you'd just let me go be with Jesus. <laughs> just leave me alone. But I thank God for him bringing people like that across my path who helped me stand. And that's why you and I are here for each other, is to help each other stand. Um, if I started having to believe God again for healing, I have a pretty good understanding of what that is, so I, I think I could be pretty good. But if it, say, I got attacked specifically with cancer, you know where I'm going to go? I'm going to go right here and say, what did God teach you? Because God can teach me through that. And every one of us has things that God has done in our lives. And all the rest of us get to learn from you how God did that. And then we all get to walk together in the victory of having overcome that. Amen. That was kind of a side journey there. <laughs> Sorry. 
Okay. So the angel said, Your prayers and your generous gifts to the poor have come up as a sacrifice to God and have been remembered by him. And now send men to Joppa and have them call for and invite there a certain Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. And so he obeys the angel and he sends for this, for Peter. And Peter, in the meantime, is having a vision where God is showing him all of the quote unquote unclean animals being let down in a sheet and being brought back up because he won't, he won't eat of them. And God says, go ahead and eat. And he finally begins to understand that if God calls something clean, who are you to call it unclean? And so all of this happens. The men from Cornelius' house uh, arrive, and Peter goes with them. And in verse 45 of this same chapter, we begin to see what happened as a result of these prayers and all of these events that took place. And the believers from among the circumcised Jews who came with Peter were surprised and amazed because the free gift of the Holy Spirit had been bestowed and poured out largely even to the Gentiles. For they heard them talking in unknown tongues and extolling and magnifying God. Then Peter asked, Can anyone forbid or refuse water for baptizing these people, seeing that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And they were baptized in the name of Jesus. So... All of these people in Cornelius' house received benefit because he was willing to pray. Just, I mean, to when you think about it, Cornelius' prayer brought, think about it, the Gentile nation in. Yes. Every so, one of us. Every one of us. And so for us, even praying, because there have been times I've got this prayer of the Lord. But all it takes is, is just one, but we've got a bunch of people here who are praying for our, for our community. And just this small group of people can cause it to come to pass. Yes. And it, and it is coming to pass. Yes. Now, now we're going to begin to paint a picture about anything. Look back up in verse 38. Because Peter went and he preached to the house of Cornelius... Um, regarding Jesus. And what did he preach about Jesus? Verse 38, How God anointed and consecrated Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, with strength and ability and power, and he went about doing good, curing all who were harassed and oppressed by the power of the devil, for God was with him. So what did he say about Jesus? He said that he went about doing good. And if you read in some other translations, it's saying healing those that were sick, casting out devils, for God was with him. Well, how did Peter know this about Jesus? One, because he walked with him. He, he was in ministry with him. He knew. But why would these things stand out regarding the ministry of Jesus? Well, let's look in Luke chapter 4 and we'll see why Luke chapter 4 beginning in verse 16 speaking of Jesus so he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and entered into the synagogue, as was his custom, on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read, and there was handed to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he unrolled the book and found the place where it was written. So he didn't just open up Isaiah and start reading anything. He was looking for something specific, and he found what he was looking for and then he spoke. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, the anointed one, the Messiah, to preach the good news, the gospel to the poor. 
He has sent me to announce, to release to the captives the recovery of sight to the blind, and to send forth as delivered those who were oppressed, who were downtrodden, bruised, crushed, broken down by calamity, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day when salvation and the free favors of God profusely abound. Then he rolled up the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And all the eyes of the synagogue were gazing at him. And he began to speak to them and said, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your ears. Now that's taken from Isaiah chapter 61. And if you read that, he quoted it exactly. Well, he's reading it. Never mind. <laughs> he said exactly what the Word said about him. God had a plan for Jesus in the earth. And Jesus coming to the earth as a human being gave us the example of how to live and walk this out. So what did he do? He found himself in the Word. And he proclaimed who he was, and it became who he was. Now, it was already God's plan for him to be this Savior of the world. But he found it in the Word, he proclaimed it, and it became. We do just like Jesus does. We find ourselves in the Word. We proclaim it, and we become it. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So we can take that same scripture and we can proclaim that. Yes. And and that is one thing that that Tim and I do on a very regular basis. Uh, in addition to the prayers in Ephesians, is we go to Isaiah chapter sixty-one, and we say, because Jesus is in me, I am anointed to preach good news to it and to go through that, that entire. And, and even though everybody may not necessarily see it, that is who we are. And that's who we're becoming. We're, we're, we're becoming who we already are. <laughs> and so you take that and you look at, at Ephesians that says that you're seated with Christ in the heavenly realm, far above all of these principalities and powers and the rules of darkness. And you take Hebrews chapter 12 that says that you are come uh, to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, and you come into that position and you accept that that's who you are and you pray from that position Amen. And there's not a devil in hell or running around on the earth that's going to stand up against you and say, uh-uh, you can't have that. They may try, but if you resist them, they have to flee. On the flip side of that, there is not an angelic force anywhere in God's kingdom that would say, okay, I know they want that, and I know that's according to the Word, but they're not going to get that because of who they are. Uh-uh. It's only people that do that to us. <laughs> so we're going to learn to lean into who God has said that we are and continually pray from that position because everything else we want in this life starts with knowing who you are and praying before God. I want to read to you a, uh, a prophecy that came forth. Uh, this was back in 1981, but these words are still true today. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Some would say, our church is a singing church. Others would say, our church is a word church. Some have said, our church is a faith church. And some have said our church is a power church. But oh, says the Lord, I am seeking 
for a praying church. I'm seeking for those that will wait upon me. For you can never sing as you ought to sing until you've waited on me. You can never walk in faith to the extent that you should walk in faith until you've waited, until prayer is as much a part of your being as breathing is of your physical person. You can never really enjoy the fullness of the Word and the power of the Word will never be in full manifestation until you become known as a praying church. Now when I hear words like this that have come forth, I take account of how that specifically applies to me. And then I use that to begin to direct my prayers to get what is the plan of God for me or for our church in this situation. So, and Tim can attest to this, one of the things that we say about Crossroads Community Church in our prayer time every day is Crossroads Community Church is a praying church. And because we pray, our church is a singing church. Because we pray, our church is a word church. Because we pray, our church is a faith church. Because we pray, our church is a power church. And let me tell you something. We've seen some amazing things happen already. And we're just beginning to scratch the surface. When you look through all of the book of Acts, there are things that happened in the book of Acts that today, those same things happening, people say, that has to be fake. This had to happen, that had to happen. They try to explain it away. But the fact is, God moved because there were people who were extending their faith out as far as they could and expecting God to move. That's us. That's us today. That's us right now. We are going out as far as we can. And we're getting what we're asking for, aren't we? And we're seeing God move. And we're going to see some things beyond anything we could ever have imagined. Here's another word that came forth. There's not a date on this one. We are moving up now into the things of God. There will come further revelation along these lines, but it has come line upon line, precept upon precept. And as it comes, men and women will flow with the Spirit, and there will be such a manifestation of my power and my glory and my Spirit that, I, that my anointing in this days, in this decade in which you live, will startle people. Now many are on the fringes of the move of God, and some will draw back and say, ah, oh, that's fanaticism. No, we can't go with that. We're believing in doing things in a nice, sedate manner. <laughs> never, never, never feel resentment toward others who may criticize you or who may speak against you. Never allow the least bit of resentment or ill will or bad feelings, but walk in love. Walk in love. Walk on in power. Walk in love. Walk on in the Spirit. Walk on in the Lord. And He will come to you and manifest Himself to you. And even as it is written in the Holy Scriptures that He is coming to us like rain, and so the Holy Ghost will fall, and the power of God will be in manifestation, and great will be the reward thereof. And many shall be blessed. My people shall be blessed blessed. And great and good days stand just ahead. Walk on. You will see, for the glory of the Lord will appear unto you. But most, most will move with the Spirit, and all will acknowledge there are miracles happening over there. And some will say, I guess God just saw fit to have mercy on them. But no, they saw fit to flow with God. And they saw fit to go with God. And that's where His glory fills the temple.
I only put my approval on that which lines up with my word. Get into the word and let the Spirit open the word to you. Not only unto your mind, but to get the revelation of it in your spirit. And your spirit will be more alive unto the things of God. And then one more. Wonderful displays of His glory coming forth. I like this part. No limits standing before us. No boundaries holding us back. Only freedom to walk in the glory and the goodness that's before us. Displays of glory, displays of wonder, miracles, healings, forever. Each and every one called by His name, walking in the freedom given. To you be glory forever, never again the same, never. There are rivers to walk through, there are rivers to dive into, swimming deep in the rivers of God. Tributaries flowing together for the sake of, of the gospel, signs and wonders displayed today, Holy Ghost ways and Holy Ghost days. Now all of these things, we come across a lot of these not because we were specifically in that particular meeting where this happened, but there is a, a prayer group that we know of that, that gets together and prays every day, and they will take these prophecies that have come forth and set them before the prayer group, and then they begin to pray regarding this word because this word has come forth, and God is saying, this is what I'm doing in the earth, so they begin to pray so that it comes to pass. So we do the same thing. We take what God has said and we say, Father, you said this, so we expect it to come to pass. And we pray until we see it. And you have to, have to, have to always pray from that same position of understanding who you are in Him. Because in that position, there's not any fear. In that position, there's not any thought of, well, maybe this may not be exactly right. In that position, you have spent time in the Word of God until you see who you are. You spent time in the Word of God and you see who He is. And you understand that when you are praying, it is according to the will of God because it agrees with what that Word says. So, what kinds of things are we believing for? What are you believing for right now, specifically? Okay. <laughs> Gotcha. I, I, I picked up on that. I'll do that to you. Well, um, the first thing I would say to that is going back to the beginning of this is in that God knows what you mean. You know, He's able to take that, and if it needs to be tweaked, Jesus will take care of it, the Holy Spirit will take care of it. Now, where healing is concerned, we have very definite 
understanding from the Word of God that, yes, healing does belong to us now. And so uh, uh, when I pray for myself regarding healing, I take the Word of God, and, and I had, um, at, at one time I had a, a list um, that someone else gave me, and I found out later that it was Dodie Osteen's list. <laughs> but it's a list of about 40 scriptures that proclaim what God's Word says about healing. And I took them kind of like medicine every day. I would get up in the morning and at, and at night, at least two times a day, and a lot of times throughout the day, because for a while I was out, I w wasn't working, so I could do it more often. And I took those scriptures, and I started with, with talking to the Father, and I said, Father, you know what your word says. But from um, the 103rd Psalm, I'm calling to remembrance all of your blessings, and these are the blessings that you have promised me regarding healing. And I'm taking these into my spirit right now. And I rehearse those words of God before God. And that, that kind of does a, a couple different things. It, it, it presents your case before God um, so that God is able... To, to see that you're serious and that you're extending your faith for these specific things that are in His Word. But it also changes you. Because I had a pretty good understanding, I thought, of, of healing. And, and I had been going to churches for quite some time that taught about healing, that, that believed in healing, that believed if you lay hands on the sick, they'll recover, and, and that healing belonged to us. And so in my head, like I said earlier, in my head I understood healing. But when I had been sick for several months and I went to the doctor and got a very serious diagnosis, when I went home after that, I, you know, I was honest before God. I said, I know what your word says, but I don't, I'm, I'm missing something because I'm not getting it in me right now. And so I just spent that time in the word and I spent that time in the word and that builds that into you. And as that begins to build, then anything that's contrary to that has to get out. And so I would say you, you do both. You continue to ask God for that healing to manifest because you know it's already there. It's already promised because the Word says it. And then you rehearse what the Word of God says about it, and then you thank God for it. And you do all of that, and it covers everything. And then... Anything that we miss, the Holy Spirit is still going to come in and take hold together with that and present your case before the Father. And it is, that healing is manifesting. And it's manifesting stronger and stronger every single day. And it's, it's doing it because one, obviously God wants to do that. But you're not standing by yourself. You've got a whole bunch of us <laughs> that are standing and believing with you. And God honors that. And, and we ain't stopping until we see the fullness of the glory of God. Right, exactly. There's not like a secret formula that's going to, poof, it's all going to happen. It, the, the whole thing, yeah, yeah. The whole thing is go back to the beginning of it and be led. Let the Holy Spirit lead you in those prayers. 
I stand on Romans 8:26, I think, more than probably anything. The Spirit himself knows our inability to pray as we ought, but he takes hold together with us and presents that case before the Father. Because I know I don't know. I, I, I'm not that smart. <laughs> but I know the one who knows. And I know how to follow him. So as I follow him, I know that whatever comes out of my mouth, it's going to get before the Father the right way. Does that make sense? Does that, does that, okay. I, uh, is it time? Well, Miss Kathy, would you close this up?